Um, so the presentation by uh, RPR today uh, is going to be about risk adjusted bonding curves, which is um, a very interesting composite of uh, bonding curves and prediction models. So it's really exciting to see the the um, the the mechanism design scope of, of bonding curves itself really expanding. And I think it's going to be a very, um, very important uh, proof of concept, since it is also focusing on social impact projects. So, Shruti, would you like to take it from here? You're muted. All right, yes. So I'll share my screen so we can all have a common view and then we can go from there. All right. Can you all see my screen? Yeah. yeah. Oh, awesome. So um, today we're going to be talking about risk adjusted bonding curves. It is a composite mechanism, like James said, it is, um, it is a composite of both the bonding curve mechanism and its risk adjusted ability is enabled by a prediction market module that we have incorporated in here. So it's a hybrid and composite mechanism consisting of both of these. And that allows us to have um, the bonding curve be dynamic and we can have um, adjustment of parameters within the bonding curve as, um, as it's being executed. So I'll give, give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, I'm. Um, a systems design engineer, I currently work as a research scientist with um, block science, as well as uh, a product lead with IOHK. Um, with block science, I do crypto economics for, um, for this risk-adjusted bonding curves research project, as well as um, a project with uh, SIFChain, which is the decentralized exchange. And um, previously, I've worked with Dapper Labs, as well as Cosmos, and a few other um, projects in the space. Um, I've also um, worked with token engineering research at Consensus and um, helped them deploy quite a bit of capital uh, with Consensus Labs, which is their venture capital arm. And I initialized and led the decentralized identity initiative at Opta. Okay, let's go through a conceptual overview of uh, some of the things that we will be talking about. A lot of the th uh, a lot of the things that we've actually built in this system are taking inspiration from several concepts that have been. Um, developed in the space of economics, as well as estimation theory, um, as well as a little bit of robotics as well. Um, so let's give an overview of complex systems. I'm sure you guys hear about this quite a bit, but uh, economic systems can be seen as complex systems as well. There's a field of uh, complexity economics that takes care of this. Um, and the reason why we say that economic systems can be um, you know, made alike to complex systems is because of certain properties. And those properties are that economic systems are nonlinear and chaotic in certain behaviors. So we are able to see um, things such as financial markets, which exhibit nonlinear behavior. Um, the, um, any effect is exemplified in a nonlinear fashion, thus leading to a very large after effect. You might've heard of this colloquially as a butterfly effect. Um, they're also chaotic, meaning that the initial conditions of the, um, of the system are extremely important. Once you set the initial conditions, um, even a slight change in the initial conditions will have a really large effect in the um, system behavior. And the interconnections between these systems matter. Um, the reason why I'm saying this is because, you know, coming from an engineering background, we are often like drilled into our heads that um, in order to study any system, we, we need to break down that system into its substituent components and study those components individually. Oftentimes what happens in these situations is we don't we don't consider what happens when these systems interact with one another, which is why we we incorporate the complex systems methodology where the interconnections and the interactions between the system matter quite a bit. And um, those interactions are considered in our analytical models while we're able to, while we an analyze these systems. And then there's also capability for such networks to self-organize. Uh, meaning that um, they often follow the priority principle of 80-20 and 80% um, of the nodes will acquire like 80% of the wealth or any other quantity that is measurable. And, um, and then there's also a, there's also a um, property that quite, quite a few times these systems, these economic systems are in non-equilibrium, 
meaning that they're constantly in flux, they're constantly there's motion and there is induction for, of agent beliefs and um and the constituent parts of the system that are driving the system into certain directions. It's not necessarily that the system ever acquires equilibrium because there's constantly input signals that are coming from all kinds of directions, typically from the participants that are participating in the system. All right, um, so how did we employ estimation theory? So the project that we're talking about in this case is a project where there are several agents that are participating in this um, bonding curve and there is specific state variables or specific information within this bonding curve that we need to estimate, right? There are certain things um, such as um, price as well as the um, parameter that controls for risk that we don't know what those um, variables are. And in order to find out what those variables are, we need to estimate them based on what the agents participating in the system perceive that. Uh, particular quantity to be, right? So, so there are two things that we're estimating here in this system. The first one is um, the price of the token. And the second one that we're estimating is the amount of risk that the particular um, project carries, right? So the price of the, the, price of the um, token can be estimated based on um, the price belief that the agents hold. So every single agent believes that the price is is of some value, right? They, they have this perception of how, how valuable that particular token is. In order to extract the system level price, what we do is we send all of these different agent private beliefs um, into actions. So based on the private beliefs, agents make actions. So if they perceive that the token is more valuable than what it is currently, then they will make a buy action, right? Or bond action into the bonding curve and thereby after they make that action, the estimator will make the price also a little bit greater. So that way we're able to estimate the price by taking agent private beliefs of price, converting them into actions using our policy, and then we use an estimator in order to arrive at a system level estimate of the price. We do the same thing with our alpha parameter as well. And the alpha parameter estimates the risk of, um, of that particular project that we're considering. So in this particular model, what we're building is a bonding curve that allows for um, several investors and several agents to participate uh, in the bonding curve in a way so as to um, invest the funding of a, of a social impact project. So since it is a social impact project, it carries quite a bit of risk um, because there are several factors that are typically unknown in the beginning which is why we, we're, we're using a risk-adjusted bonding curve and not necessarily a static bonding curve. And so in order um, to make this problem a little less complicated um, and a little less um, fast, what we did was we used the concept of configuration spaces. So the general state space of the system describes all of the possible states that a system can take. Right? But then it is not necessarily true that a system will be able to take a particular, um, a particular state because it is just theoretically not possible given the, um, given the conservation laws of the system. So um, for example, if you see any real world system, it is not possible that the price can be um, A and as well as B at the same time or for the alpha to be really high while the price is really low. So alpha being very high means that the, um, there, there's a lot of belief in the project that the project will really succeed. Why would the price be so low if alpha is so high, right? So there are certain things that like just don't make sense um, intuitively speaking as well as analytically speaking in the general state space. And we want to exclude all of those possibilities because they're just not analytically achievable. So what we did was we, we came up with conservation laws that allowed us to constrain the state space into a much smaller configuration space. So all of our exploration and analysis is limited to this configuration space domain. And that makes um, the problem, uh, the optimization problem a lot easier to, um, to solve. Let's move on to the system design of the system. So how did we um, you know, set up and characterize the system? So first we have the state variables of the system. So the state variables include things such as 
um, reserve supply, alpha, kappa invariance, as well as the agent state. Um, we'll come back to this a little bit further when we're going through the model. And then we have agents' private beliefs. So essentially, these private beliefs are the inputs to the system. These are what we need to be um, estimating to arrive at the system level state variables such as alpha and kappa. So the private belief of alpha will feed into an agent action and then it will turn into the, um, into the system level alpha. So there are several agents, they will all have different private beliefs and then those will feed into estimating our system level state variables. And those are arrived at by taking actions and the way the actions are taken are determined by the policies. Um, going back to how we were wanted to constrain the action space, we constrained the action space as well as the state space. So earlier we were talking about configuration spaces. Um, and similarly, we have action spaces as well. Basically what we did was we imposed operational requirements on all the possible actions that can be taken by an agent. And then we constrained it to only the permissible actions that, uh, that an agent can take in order to arrive at an action space. So basically agents cannot take actions um, that are outside of what they're allowed. So for example, if you're, if you only hold like 10 tokens, you can't make a bond action or I mean a burn action with 80 tokens, right? So it's just not permitted. Um, and by imposing this operational requirement, we just remove out all of those possibilities and we arrive at a much smaller action space, um, which we can um, deal with in a more uh, cleaner fashion. So similarly, we also uh, limited the general space, state space using conservation functions. Conservation functions are similar to the conservation laws that we were talking about earlier um, to limit it to a much smaller configuration space. Okay, now let's talk about uh, bonding curves and a little bit more about um, diving deep into like what this use case is about and um, uh, what risk adjusted bonding curves and the motivation for it are. So traditionally bonding curves are static um, where to bond means essentially to buy into the bonding curve, to buy tokens um, that the curve um, offers, right? And it is used as a mechanism to distribute tokens and so tokens can be issued as well as burned through um, buy and sell functions. So in this case, buy and sell functions, we typically refer to them as bonded burn functions, so just a terminology thing. And however, there is a shortcoming for, for these bonding curves uh, being static. Um, the shortcoming is that oftentimes when you're setting up a bonding curve, it has fixed a priori assumptions. And those assumptions are set, set at the start of the bonding curves as the parameters, and then you're just not able to change them as the bonding curve is executing itself. And so since they are fixed, you're not able to account for things such as external factors, risk, agents' perceptions, and so on. So if your um, starting point is, say, in year one, and your ending point is at year eight, you have to make predictions about what is going to happen throughout the span of seven years. Um, in order to set your parameters and set up your bonding curve at the start. So it is, um, yeah, so this is the main shortcoming of it. And so that's why it's, it makes it like a little bit inapplicable to, uh, to areas where there's tons of variations in how the uh, bonding curve execution can pan out and so on. So some of the downfalls of this um, static bonding curves are also that uh, it cannot incorporate risk um, and as a result of that, tokens often get misallocated and risk also accumulates nonlinearly because of the fact that um, if there's a certain risk factor, it, it doesn't get accounted for during the execution of the bonding curve. And so it, it keeps um, piling up and accumulating nonlinearly, just thus causing a much larger um, effect towards the future. And as a result of this, this can either lead to typically poor ROI for the investors but at some points it can also lead to systemic collapse if the nonlinear effect of the risk is so large. So this is why um, we have the idea of the risk adjusted bonding curve, right? So we want to make it such that the bonding curve success really depends upon what happens during the execution of that particular bond. And what happens during the execution of the bond is really determined 
on what um, factors are taken into consideration for calculating the risk. And those factors are things such as agents' beliefs of risk, external factors such as how well the project is actually going, um, and we can measure those kinds of things by, you know, keeping tabs on the project and um, getting signals from things such as a mobile app, um, which is which is used in one of our use cases um, for basically doing product metrics and KPIs on how well a particular project is performing. And so based on the performance of the project, we're able to estimate the risk or the likelihood of success of that project. And we're able to update um, this particular risk um, into the into the bonding curve and the bonding curves um, properties change based on um, based on the risk that we have just calculated and this happens continually as as um, as usual throughout the execution of the bond so throughout the execution of the bond we're constantly adjusting for risk and as a result of that uh, we're able to ensure that the investors get a better ROI. Okay, so how do we go about modeling this? Um, so we've talked about a few different stages in this um, in this particular um, system, right? So the first stage is uh, the three initialization stage, and um, which after that comes comes the initialization phase, which which is when all of the parameters are set, as well as all of the thresholds, initial conditions, as well as the roles of the agents are set up, and following that. Um, we have a transition into the execution phase. This is the main phase of the project. This is when all of the um, activity happens, the bond actions, the burn actions, as well as the attestation actions to determine if uh, the project is risky or less risky or to determine the success of the bond. All of these actions happen during this phase. This is the main live phase of the project. And following that, we have a settlement consideration phase where we essentially take into consideration what the agents have acted upon and calculate their ROI based on um, how truly successful the bond actually is. And finally, um, we have the settlement phase when the agents get their payouts based on the actions that they have taken and based on the predictions that they have made about the success of the bond. So we characterize the, um, the different agents into different roles as well. So there's an investment agent, uh, which is typically the agent that um, that bonds as well as burns into the system. And then there are several other agents that help with the um, setting up of that particular project. And then there's an outcomes pair, which is the agent that um, evaluates um, whether the project was successful or not. And based on the predictions that these investment agents made, the outcomes pair disperses the payments. And then there are evaluators as well. These are basically um, people who ensure that the data arriving in the system is actually true and that it matches the um, agent's attestations or agent actions. Okay, so the mechanisms that are within the system, as we talked about earlier, it is really a composite mechanism. It consists of both the bonding curve as well as the prediction market. In the bonding curve, you're able to bond to mint or burn to ritual. So bond is essentially to buy into the bonding curve and burn is to sell out of the bonding curve. And then we have a prediction market as well. So this is the module that allows us to estimate the risk of that particular project. And within this, you can attest positively or negatively. You can think of attestations are basically as basically predictions or bets that the agents are making whether the project will be successful or not. So if an agent thinks that the project will be successful, they will attest pos positively and then they will acquire these S1 tokens. And if they attest negatively, they will acquire S0 tokens. And as you can see, both of these are bond only mechanisms. So let's talk a little bit more about this hybrid system. The reason why we have this hybrid system, it also allows us to have invariance on both of these systems. Um, so earlier we talked about you know, constraining the general state space, which is a fairly large space into a much smaller space, right? How do we, how do, we do that? We do that by uh, imposing invariance. Basically, we come up with uh, conservation laws and we come up with those analytically based on you know, estimating what actions are possible as well as what um, states are achievable. And based on those, we arrive at conservation laws. And those conservation laws have invariance. Invariance basically relate 
uh, one particular quantity or state variable in the system to another state variable in the system, such that um, at any point in the system, that particular relationship is conserved. So we have two local invariants. So we have a V invariant, invariant V, which is on the bonding curve. And then we have invariant I on the attestation um, or the prediction market. And so what we mean by those things is that V is always conserved. It does not change um, when only the bonding curve is concerned. And invariant I does not change when only the prediction market is concerned. However, they're only locally invariant, meaning that when the, when, um, the attestation mechanism is in operation or when there is a prediction action or an attestation place, V will change. And likewise, if a bond or burn action is staked, I will change. So yes, this is what I was explaining earlier with regards to the invariance. So whenever a prediction um, market action, which is an attestation is taken, I is conserved, invariant I is conserved, as well as um, there is a change in all of these different state variables. However, when this action is taken, V changes. And likewise, in the bonding curve, whenever bond or burn action is taken, then we'll have a V conserved, but that changes I. So there are local invariants. And so let's talk a little bit more about this prediction market module, because I think this is like, this is basically like the novel um, aspect of the system. We have bonding curves already, but incorporating prediction markets within bonding curves essentially allows us to adjust for risk. And um, that's a relatively new concept. So how are we able to adjust for risk? Right. So we have this parameter alpha, and alpha is basically a measure of the likelihood of success of the bond. Right? So you can think of alpha as a measure of risk as well. So it's a converse of that, All right? Um, so we initialize alpha with some number. Let's say we initialize with 0 0.5 between 0 and 1. So that um, determines how likely it is to be successful. So 0 0.5 makes it um, such that the bond is equally likely to succeed or to fail. And so whenever an agent attests positively or when they bet positively for the project, then they move alpha up. And so the system alpha will move up. And whenever an agent attests negatively, then the system alpha will move down. And the agents are making these actions based on their private belief of what they think the, the project is going to be successful or not. So based on their private belief, which is the alpha hat that you see here, they attest positively or negatively. And finally, after all of these agents have taken their actions, um, an agent can basically place as many attestations as they, as they want, and they can make those attestations at any time step. And finally, um, we will arrive at the final alpha at settlement. And so this particular alpha will determine whether the bond, the project was actually successful or not, because the, that is the final estimate of what the um, risk or the likelihood of success for that project is. And based on that, we will be dispersing all of the um, payments to the agents. So that's where they will get their return on investment. And so you can see how with this model, we are able to take the private beliefs of alphas of each of these agents, and we're able to convert them into actions using a policy. Um, and then we're able to send this to an estimator in order to estimate the system level alpha and then finally arrive at the system level alpha. So a little bit more about how these private beliefs get converted into actions. Uh, we do that through a policy. So we have it set up in such a way that um, whenever, um, whenever the private belief of alpha of the agent is lesser than the private, um, than the system alpha, then the agent will attest positively in order to move the alpha up. And likewise, on the other side as well, whenever they're um, their private belief is greater than the um, system level alpha, then they will move it in the direction so that um, it matches their um, private belief a little bit more. So what the agents are attempting to do is basically decrease the difference between the system level alpha and their private belief of alpha. And the power with which they can make these actions is directly proportional to how many tokens they hold. So if they hold more tokens, then they have more ability to um, to match 
the system level alpha and and so on so finally they arrive at the system level alpha or, or we arrive at the system level alpha using the estimator and then based on that we can make um, agent payouts and so we also have a um, you know we, we need to figure out how to actually update alpha right so as you saw here um, the way in which um, an agent action relates to the system change in system level alpha is what we're considering in this particular equation. And the way we um, formalize that is by using a Markov chain update process um, with a convex combination of the current state alpha as well as the realized alpha, which is basically the alpha that um, the agent has caused to move towards. So we need to take into consideration that um, the alpha shouldn't move too wildly when an agent makes a particular action, right? So the next state alpha is based on some fraction of the current state alpha, and the rest of the fraction goes on to the alpha that is calculated based on the agent action. So if this epsilon is very high, then the alpha doesn't move too far. So there's less volatility in alpha, as you can imagine. But if this is very low, then the alpha is able to move very, um, very widely based on the agent's actions. All right, so now that we have seen, seen all of this, um, I can go through a round of questions and then we can also talk about how we structure the code, um, some of the results that we have realized from our simulations, as well as um, a few different properties we can demonstrate. Thank you very much, Ruthie. So I've also dropped the um, the repo and the documentation for the project in the CAD CAD community core uh, text room for anyone. Uh, dive in there. There's a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of stuff here. So there's a lot to go into uh, dive in for whoever wants to. And um, well, I'd just like to ask from a really high level. What are the key um, objectives for for this design on a on a very very high level? Yeah, so so we can think of key objectives for this design as well as the key objectives for for the overall project. So the key objectives for the project are such that um, we want to ensure that the um, that the system which is facilitating this funding mechanism is very close to what the real world um, things that are happening with really that are related to the impact bonds that the funding mechanism is funding, right? So we want to make sure that the system that's present on the blockchain that is running um, the funding mechanism in order for agents to invest into it, you know, do the bonding curve activities as well as the prediction market and so on, that closely mirrors what is actually going on in the real world with regards to these projects, which is why we have the prediction market module, because that way we're able to collect the insights from the real world, um, external factors such as, you know, how the project is actually going, the agent's perceptions of how successful the project is, and so on. Um, and we're able to feed it into this on-chain system so that it updates itself based on real world data signals. And as a result of that, um, we're trying to match it as much as possible. So compared to, to a legacy um, system of distributing fund social impact projects, um, what I'm, from, from my perspective, what I'm seeing, that which, which is really uh, interesting, is the potential to incentivize curation, number one, and number two, to um, open up or democratize access to liquidity to uh, social impact projects. And, and in both these instances, it's done through incentivized ways. That's right, yeah. Continuous funding, which is your second point, is a big uh, reason why we have this um, way to um, have a risk-adjusted bonding curve, because if it was a static bonding curve, then continuous funding becomes extremely tricky because you're not able to estimate the risks beforehand. However, by allowing the investors to make more informed decisions, and they're able to inform their decisions a little bit more because they have this risk uh, module, which is the primary factor in any decision-making 
um, investment decision making. Um, they're able to guarantee or or make better in, and more informed decisions with regards to their uh, where, where they're able to put their money. So so that allows them to essentially control for um, how risky a project is, as well as if they want it, want to make the project very successful also, they can invest um, uh, more heavily into it to drive the alpha up and that can have secondary effects. Right, and, and on another level, um, instead of having a committee of bureaucrats uh, deciding on the viability of projects, it would be more of a curation market process that is open for participation. Who are the agents who are uh, actually able to be uh, involved in the development? Could this be anyone? Is it an open market? Mm -hmm. Yeah, as long as the agents participate in the bonding curve, they're able to participate in the prediction market as well. So the only prerequisite for um, participating in the prediction market is that you hold some amount of supply tokens and you're able to acquire supply tokens by bonding into the bonding curve. You can acquire the supply tokens and then you're able to make attestations. And so the attestations basically move alpha up and down and thereby you're controlling the um, controlling your investments based on the risk um, factor associated with these projects. So anyone can participate it as long as they have um, the supply tokens. And it's very straightforward to acquire supply tokens just, just as you would participate in any other bonding curve. So yeah, like you said, it is um, a much more democratic system because it doesn't um, it doesn't have the prerequisite of you know requiring bureaucrats to be making decisions about whether a, a project gets funded or not and so on. It allows anyone to fund the project as well as anyone to you know break out of the project if they don't think it's going to be very successful. And it does so in a much uh, in a much more frictionless manner too. So we're in the open questions uh, part of the um, of the presentation. So uh, anyone, please uh, shoot away. Um, I wonder, Shruti, where are the limit or potential attack vectors of such systems? So, for example, the information based on uh, how agents decide on whether to test positively or negatively, this is um, can be implemented in, in all sorts of ways, I guess. But at the same mm -hmm. time, what what is the ultimate, um, uh, maybe you can give an example on the ultimate result of, um, of a project to be successful or not, because a prediction is, well, it's a prediction could be gamed as well. Yeah, so we, we did uh, investigate a little bit further into one of the attack vectors is that what if the agents collude um, outside of this game in order to um, in order to bring the project down, right? So what if they all could just collectively attest negatively in order to, um, you know, reap some personal gains? So that attack vector, we, we actually designed a mechanism so that we, we essentially avoid that attack vector altogether. So the rewards associated with um, attesting positively are strictly greater, um, it will result in a strictly greater fi final payout as opposed to the rewards associated with attesting negatively. So if, the, if a whole bunch of agents collude in order to attest negatively to bring the project down, ultimately their single, their individual payouts towards settlement will be, will end up being much lesser than what they would have gotten if they had just either stayed neutral or if they had attested positively. So we were able to analytically ensure that, um, or using policy design, we were able to ensure that that kind of uh, attack vector doesn't exist um, or it is avoided because of policy design. And um, that is one of the key attack vectors. I think the other attack vectors are also with regards to you know, data integrity and so on. And it is a prediction market. So what we're assuming is that the agents are making their actions based on reliable and high integrity signals from the real world, right? Because all of these actions on the prediction market, as well as the bonding curve, are based on 
real world signals, but these signals need to actually be um, trustworthy. So that is um, really a consideration that comes into play when we're designing the data channels within the system. So those need to be ensured that they have high integrity as well as um, low um, redundancy as well as high trustworthiness. Um, and they also need to be updated frequently. And so the, the data lag, um, the, the time lag shouldn't be very high in terms of that data. So mm -hmm. those are typically considerations where we have um, in terms of designing oracles. And they definitely need to be taken into consideration for this one as well, because the prediction market module entirely relies on the external factor signals that are uh, interpreted by agents and transformed into actions on the chain system. Yeah, got it, true. And um, maybe we can go to the slide on um, defining alpha and, and this ultimate settlement you presented, because I was wondering if there could be a stage where the ROI for making attestations is greater than from the token itself on the bonding curve. Mm -hmm. It is. This is possible. Mm. Yeah, this is possible. And in, in fact, this is how it's supposed to be mm -hmm. um, for the system to really um, work. Because why else would a would an agent make an attestation, right? Like otherwise they would just participate in the bonding curve and they would exit taking the ROI. Um, we actually ran one of the tests based on that. Um, let's hope this one loads. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, we ran a test to, to, uh, to investigate this exact property that you're talking about where we investigate if the agent payouts are greater um, when the agents participate only in the bonding curve, or are they greater when they participate in both the bonding curve as well as the prediction market. And so we empirically were able to demonstrate that um, using the simulation. So what we do here is first we, we feed in um, a private belief of alpha. Mm -hmm. And so we have it such that it's linearly increasing from 0 0.5 to one, um, and in both of these um, in both of these experiments, we're basically only controlling for whether the the prediction market module exists or not. So they're set up in the exact same way. The only thing that we're changing between these two experiments is the existence of a prediction market module. So in this one, the prediction market module does not exist. So this is the price movement that you can see here, and the agents payouts are for the twenty agents that we have here. Our agents are earning approximately like. 90, 95 tokens towards the end, like this is their settlement payout, right? So now let's see what happens if they participate in both the prediction market module as well as the bonding curve, okay? I've set it up the same way, 0 0.5 to one private belief. And this is how the price moves, mm -hmm. this case. And we can see here that uh, these are the agent payouts. So earlier in the previous one, we saw that the agents were approximately earning 95 tokens, but over here, almost all of the agents are earning over 150 tokens as their payout, given the same setup. Um, the only difference here is that this is um, this is a system with both the prediction market module as well as the bonding curve, right? So they are able to earn um, greater rewards and they're able to make uh, more informed decisions, which leads to a higher variation in their payouts towards the end. If you remember the previous graph, it was mostly like around the same um, payout for all of the agents, but here there's a much larger variation as well because the agents make informed decisions based on their risk appetite. I was just uh, finally wondering if making predictions could weight out all the losses you might have um, on the bonding curve itself, right? So that um, influencing and, and making attestations um, can, uh, yeah, pay for all, all kinds of losses on the bonding curve, which then again, this could be an attack vector. But maybe, yeah, I have to dive deeper into that. Yeah, I, I think like if we're if we we're considering the system as really a composite system we, we don't try to separate the bonding curve and as well as the prediction market mm -hmm. so if you have losses on the bonding curve that will be that will essentially mean that you're less able to participate in the prediction market because a loss mm -hmm. in the bonding curve would 
mean that you have fewer supply tokens, so your power to participate in the prediction market is also lesser. So if, you, if we look at it in that way, um, it is true that at every time step, the agent is given a plate of three choices. Either stay within the bonding curve, like keep your supply tokens either in the bonding curve or attest it positively or attest it negatively. You have to make this choice, right? Mm -hmm. And if they choose to attest positively or negatively, then essentially they're moving over their, um, their position within the system to be a um, be more invested in the prediction market, right? Mm -hmm. So if they're more invested in the prediction market, they can choose either to attest um, positively or negatively. And depending upon what ends up being the outcome, like so if the if the project succeeds, then whoever attested positively will earn more. If the project mm -hmm. fails, then um, they wouldn't. So it is, yeah, so it's, it's basically like um, where, like what kind of risk profile and um, you know, analytic decision an agent makes based on the choices that they're given at every time step, which is either to stay in the bonding curve and not, you know, and not play the whole prediction market game at all, or mm -hmm. if they want to play the prediction market game, then they're able to, you know, um, based on their risk appetite, choose um, how much they want to put in the as positive or ne negative buckets. Okay. Since we're at the top of the hour, um, it'd be nice to have any other questions from from uh, others who are on this call. Um, uh, yes, yeah. brief. So, is there any mapping to a real world um, uh, project that that could have used this system? Um, yeah. So we're we're using this um, this module in the Chimple pilot. Uh, use case, which is the one that I was just demonstrating here. So Shimple Learning is essentially this nonprofit organization based in India. They are um, dedicated to improving ch children's learning experience. And the way we're using this particular project is um, we have several investors that actually want to um, want to contribute to this project, to the Shimple Learning project. And we have data signals from the Shimple Learning project using uh, mobile apps that basically um, give give the investors signals um, based on how well the children are performing in their um, in their educational games. So those educational games are basically like things that that are very akin to tests, but um, they're in the form of games, and we are able to collect all of the game statistics um, coming from each of these different um, learning institutions, and then um, that will help. The investors make more informed decisions on whether to invest in the project or not. So if they see that the children are performing better and better over time, then they're able to make their alpha decisions or attestation decisions based on that. So the pretty cool project and our implementation partner for this is um, the IXO Foundation. And they have a partnership with um, with Chimple, and they're implementing this using their alpha bonds which is which is basically the design that we talked about over here. So yeah, they're given awesome. puzzles and so on. So so and, yeah, so following up on that, so the 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 signals come from um, some sort of traditional, but but let's call it high tech um, tr traditional reporting from the um, from the from the NGO implementing the. The, the project and Absolutely. you can mm -hmm. there's some sort of um platform where investors that want to play the um the the attestations game can can receive this in sort of close to real time yeah yeah so essentially we have many many ways in which that um the data feed can arrive right so one of the ways in is through the apps and the games that the children are playing, those will be um, made available in in close to real time to the investors so that the investors can base their um, decisions based on the um, based on the data feeds they receive publicly as well as privately. So these the private price expectation and private private alpha expectation is based on their own like the agent's own intuition of what the 
um, of what the um, price or the alpha is supposed to be. But then there's also the seeds as well as sand, which come completely externally. So this will co contain things such as the um, signals that are coming from the app. And then this contains information that have to do with any sentiment that you're able to obtain from you know, public channels such as social media channels and so on about the price. But for the alpha, they do receive a um, updated feed every once in a while regarding the progress of the, um, of the project um, from the signals that are obtained from the games, the games and puzzles the children are playing. Okay, so um, let's have maybe five, five more minutes and anyone else who wants to ask any questions. Right. So, if, there, if is there any other questions? Um, I mean, you can always follow up with uh, Sruti in the in the CAD CAD community on the on Discord. Yeah. Um, there are also a few links here for for you guys to go check out on the uh, on the repo. We have the main project here in the Interchain Foundation repo with block signs. And then um, if you want any other questions answered, you can also reach out to me directly on my email or my telegram. Great. Thank you very much, Ruthie. It, it's uh, it, it's right. been an amazing presentation. Very, um, very informative and a lot of stuff to dive into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a lot of fun working yeah. on it as well. Thanks for coming, folks. Thanks for presenting. Thank you. Thank you. Next Cat Cat community call is in two weeks. Do we have any speakers lined up for that one? Yeah, I'm not sure. James? <laughs> David? Let's see. Let's see. Is it an open slot at the moment? I don't know. I'm just wondering what's the next date. Yes. Um, I don't know. We need to. I need to ask ah, each other as well. Good. All right. Good. Do Thanks a lot. Do you think at the same time as well? Okay.